All right, uh, who's ready to learn how to, uh, uh, how to evaluate uh, relational algebra? Good, good. There's some people who are awake here. Uh, come on. Good morning. Good, good morning. Thank you. Okay. All right, so we've been talking about SQL. We've been talking about relational algebra. Now hopefully you guys have a sense of how to translate uh, from SQL to relational algebra. But that doesn't get us all the way there. Uh, we have kind of the first half of the pipeline. Now we're going to talk about the second half of the pipeline. Going from that parsed query, going from that relational algebra expression uh, to a set of results. Um, most of what we're going to be talking about here is uh, a couple of different evaluation strategies. And I'm going to try and point out which ones uh, make the most sense for project one. And I'll probably try and slide in a couple of things uh, for how that affects project two as well, uh, two and three. OK, um, so how do we evaluate relational algebra expressions? Well, just to give you kind of a quick picture of uh, how, uh, how the, the lecture is going to play out. First, I'm going to talk about a really, really uh, simple but not necessarily very efficient uh, approach to evaluation called staged evaluation. I'm going to talk then about a uh, slightly more efficient form of that uh, that we call uh, a pull or a volcano operator style uh, database uh, evaluation strategy. And uh, time permitting, I might uh, briefly delve into uh, another model called push-based evaluation uh, that makes use of multiple processors. Um, if not, that'll probably get deferred until later on in the term. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. It's at least not for now. OK, so how do you evaluate a relational algebra expression? Well, here's a simple expression. Uh, in fact, the same expression from last time. And uh, how, how would I go about evaluating this? So if I want the, uh, the output of the, uh, the projection operator, what's the first thing I need to do? OK, so I need to start all the way at the bottom. Uh, projection, <coughs> in order to compute the output, well, the output depends on the projection. The projection depends on uh, the join. The join depends on the selection, and the selection depends on ships. So the very first thing I'd need to do is load ships into memory. OK. Ooh, animation's fancy, right? Um, I load ships into memory. Now I have a bunch of stuff in memory. What do I do with it? OK, so my load operation returns that collection. And now my selection operator can uh, do its magic. It can go through all of the rows of that uh, collection. And it can delete everything that, isn't, uh, that doesn't satisfy the condition, uh, returning enterprise. OK, so now my selection operation uh, returns another collection, this one containing only one element. Uh, what happens next? OK, so now this join operation depends both on the output of the selection as well as on the other half. So now in addition to loading, uh, to, to getting the collection on the right-hand side, I need the collection on the left-hand side. Same deal. I call an operation uh, that loads uh, the relation into memory, parses all of the, the data, and gives me a uh, collection consisting of all of the officers. All right, now I have two collections. They're feeding in my input. And uh, now I can actually perform the join. I'll go into the details of how that happens in a bit. But I can perform the join. Uh, ooh, more animations. Um, and I get an output. All right, so now the join returns a value. Go back up to the projection. I project out all the columns I don't care about. And I get. The final result, this. OK, now this is a very straightforward evaluation strategy. Um, every single operator represents one 
whole thing that I perform on an, uh, one whole transformation that I perform on an entire collection. And you can think of this essentially as a program. Uh, first ships, then select, then officers, then join, then project, and now uh, that uh, I can uh, output whatever uh, I get as a result of that. And th at every stage, I have a couple of different collections to work with. So here's my question to you. Can we do any better than that? Or more generally, what's, uh, do you see anything potentially that we can improve on in this design? Can you speak up? OK, so some of those operations you can do in parallel. Um, you can potentially, the two sides of the join, you can evaluate those collections in parallel. Uh, that's great. And we'll get back to parallel evaluation towards uh, a bit later in the term. Um, or actually, the push-based model uh, addresses this a little bit as well. Um, even if I was doing this in a single thread, though, there's some potential ways that I, I could improve it. Or there's some potential flaws. Um, any thoughts on what those? Yeah? So the observation is that um, the select operation and the load operation could potentially compose. Um, how would you go about doing that? Or how, how, would you, how would they compose, I guess is my, my question. OK. So, so if there's an act, uh, so the, the comment is that I could only load in a specific set of attributes, uh, namely the ones that are relevant to the query, uh, in this case the ship, let me go back, uh, in this case the uh, first name, the ship, uh, the ID columns. How does that help us? Okay, so you're loading less, uh, the comment is that uh, you'd be loading less data. Um, yes and no. Uh, the yes in that you're uh, picking, oh, well, let me start with the no. Uh, if your file is stored row wise, you still need to go through the entire file to pick out uh, every record, although in this case, the data, let's say that the data is in a CSV file, as it is in uh, the course project, you would be loading less data how? So what are the steps that I need to take in order to load the data in? So I have to split it up into rows, and in order to do that, I have to read the entire file in. But then, I, then what do I do if I, once I've split it into rows? Okay, so I'd need to know what's in each field as well. And let's say I have uh, a CSV file again uh, that's going to be a set of ASCII characters, let's say that represents a number. What would I need to do with that number? Okay, so I'd need to translate that number into something that I can actually work with, like uh, wor work with more efficiently, like an integer. If it's uh, a string representing an integer, I need to actually translate that string into an integer. And that actually turns out to be a very expensive operation, all things considered. Especially, <coughs> especially when you're performing it once for every single row of the data. So, okay, there's a great, uh, uh, there's a great potential here for uh, reducing the amount of computation that we need by uh, kind of pushing some information down into the load operators. Uh, and telling the load operators that there's only certain columns that we're interested in. I could also potentially save myself the effort of uh, extracting certain columns if I, if I could get rid of the row immediately based on one or two columns. So there's some, some benefits there as well. So let me ask you this. What's our working set size? 
for this query. Actually, let me back up because I haven't. Uh, quick show of hands. Who has heard the term working set before? OK. So now, th this is one of those cases where I'll throw in a little bit of, uh, of a, a term here to, to make sure you guys are paying attention. Someone should raise their hand and say, hey, Oliver, what's a working set? OK? I want someone to take responsibility for that. In this case, a working set. Um, how much memory do we need to keep around, or how much data do we need to keep around in order to process whatever it is that we're processing? How much memory are we using? And that, that's basically a, uh, the working set is the amount of uh, data structures you need to keep, uh, or the set of data structures you need to keep in memory uh, at any given time to do whatever it is you're doing. So in this case, what's the working set size? Or what, what is the working set? OK, so we're keeping an entire relation in memory. Is that going to work in general? No. Um, and even if it did, even if the entire relations did fit in memory, what are we doing at, uh, let's say, when we're evaluating the selection predicate? What are we, how are we interacting with that collection? Hmm? OK, so we're removing elements from the collection, uh, but how? Which parts of the collection are we accessing? And how are we accessing the, it? Hmm? Well, in this case, the selection predicate has to be applied to every single row. So we're, we're essentially scanning over the entire collection. And then we go to the next step, and we scan over the entire collection again. And then we go to the next step. We scan over the coll entire collection again. All right. Who here thinks that's a good thing? Good. OK, that's the one case where you should not raise your hands. Um, so scanning over the, the entire collection, what's that going to do to, uh, how is that going to affect our performance? And why? Uh, speak up. Okay, so reading from the list, but how is that going to affect our? Hmm? Oh, uh, reading from the disk. Let's uh, even if it's all in memory, how is that going to affect our performance? Hmm? Okay, so you're iterating over the entire file, and then you end up with. Uh, so how is that going to interact with uh, the cache? The cache is going to be tiny. The, so even if the entire thing does fit in memory, your caches are going to be tiny. So you're going to scan over the entire thing. That entire thing is going to go into the cache. And then it's going to get thrown out immediately after the next time you start another scan. And you're doing these scans over and over and over and over again, which ends up being actually kind of horrible. So every time, every, uh, in this staged evaluation model, every single time uh, you scan over the entire collection, you're basically copying that collection to a new location in memory, because you have to create a, uh, you have to do whatever computations it is that you're doing. You don't get cache locality, because all of those, uh, uh, I mean, a scan, you basically, Scans are the worst possible things for caches. And your memory use kind of blows up. Uh, you're working with entire, f entire tables. And in general, that's not going to fit in memory. So this is, this is a pretty, pretty abysmal uh, design. So here's my question to you. How do we do better? Yeah. OK, so you can potentially break up the entire relation into smaller blocks and process each block one at a time. Now, I'm going to propose something even more drastic. Process a single tuple at a time. Um, pr 
practically every single database system uh, that I would care to speak of at the moment, or each of the major database systems anyway, use some variant of this technique, uh, which is identical to what Java calls an iterator. Uh, your textbook also calls this an iterator. Um, sometimes you'll see the term volcano operator. And what, the, what an iterator is, uh, well, it's a class or, or an object that you keep calling, and every time you call it, uh, it gives you another tuple, another row of the, uh, that it, it would have produced. Just in terms of managing bookkeeping, uh, database iterators also tend to have an open method that allows them to set things up and a closed method that allows them to tear things down again. Uh, I'll explain why those are necessary in a couple of slides. Okay, so, yeah. So the question is, in the iterator model, do, is the entire query evaluated on one tuple at a time? There are, there is one, there, there are a handful of cases where the answer changes, and we'll, we'll discuss those, but the answer is essentially yes. Um, the idea is that you can create an iterator for every single operator, and that iterator is going to depend on the child of that operator. So if I have a, well, we'll get to this in, in one or two slides, but if you have a project operator, that's defined in terms of a, the output of the child operator. So if I want to get the next tuple from the project operator, the project operator calls get next on its input. It gets a tuple, does whatever it needs to do, and then returns that tuple. I'll get it, uh, let me get uh, into this in one or two slides. Uh, if you still have a question, then, uh, Get your hand back up. Uh, any questions on just kind of the general structure of iterators or anything I've said up to this point? Okay. So just to give, uh, just to start this off, relation, the simplest possible operator you can think of, one line at a time. Relation operator, you can define an iterator that reads one line from the file, splits the line into fields, and then parses the individual field values. And then returns the tuple. What is my working set size now for this, just for this one operation? There's one row, exactly. Much smaller, one row versus one relation, tiny. All right, projection, same deal. Read one tuple, compute whatever uh, projection the, uh, the projection operator is supposed to compute, and then return it. Again, what's the working set size? One tuple, great. <coughs> All right, so so far each of these have been basically one for one. Selection is a little bit more tricky uh, in that you can read a tuple. You have to test the condition that the selection operator is, uh, is testing for. And if it turns out the, uh, the condition is false, you have to go back, read, the, read another tuple. And you just keep reading them until you find one that fits, and you return that. Now, th this is computationally more complex 
But what's the working set size? It's still one tuple. So far, all of these three operators that I've defined uh, can be defi uh, don't take up any memory whatsoever. They just one tuple worth of memory. This is great. All right, here's another one. Union. Well, if I want to implement union, I keep reading from. I can implement that by reading. Or, let me back up. If I want to implement bag union, in other words, if I am okay with uh, duplicate values. I can read all of the tuples from one relation, and then I read all of the tuples from the other relation once the first one is empty. What's my working set size here? One tuple. I can just keep reading. What I only need to keep one tuple in memory. Be uh, whatever get next tuple returns from R. And then as soon as R is empty, whatever get next tuple returns from S. This is really, really tiny stuff. OK. Yes? Uh, the question is, wouldn't we need uh, one tuple from R and one tuple from S? Um, if you are reading all of the tuples from R before even starting, S, then you don't need to look at S until you've finished with R. So, I mean, you could allocate two tuples worth of memory just for convenience, but you wouldn't need that memory. One of those tuples would always be sitting unused. Yes? So the question is, isn't this expensive in terms of uh, memory? Uh, because you will need to keep accessing, um, because you'll need to keep creating tuples, create, uh, keep destroying them. Am I getting that right? Um, yeah. Okay. OK, so the, the, uh, to clarify, the question is, uh, wouldn't it be more efficient to load the entire relation into cache first, do the processing on the entire relation, and then... Or maybe... OK, so wouldn't it make sense to buffer uh, uh, several tuples into, into cache at once? And you're right. Um, the model I'm describing is meant to be meant to ensure that the entire uh, the entire pipeline fits in cache because as I've been saying the the working or as you guys have been saying uh, the working set size is one and a working set size of one is almost certainly guaranteed to fit in cache not always the case but uh, working set size of one is almost certainly guaranteed to fit in the cache and the entire relation on the other hand is not guaranteed to fit in cache um, what you're saying, however, is spot on. Um, buffering is buffering several uh, tuples into cache at once, processing all of those in one go, is actually uh, what a lot of database systems do end up doing. What I'm describing here is a simpler form of that, because you can you got to take what's what's going on here and add buffering on top of it much more easily than you can, uh, th that's much easier to describe than the algorithms with buffering. Does that address your question? Yes? Um, this doesn't work for group I or having. Ah, that's, a great o that's a great observation. Um, in fact, let me back up a little. So how would we go about implementing nested, uh, excuse me, how would we go about implementing uh, cross product using this model? Yeah.
OK, so I can load one tuple from each relation. And then what happens next? OK, so I compute, I output the, uh, I, I stick those two tuples together, put a, uh, generate an output, and then I go to, what, what, what tuple do I go to next? The second tuple in, uh, let me, I have a slide on this. But, so let's say I have one, two, three, A, B, C. All right. I'm, I'm the query processor. One, A. That's my first output. Now what, what do I do next? One, B. OK, what do I do next? One, C. OK, so I'm still looking at one tuple at a time. Uh, what next? All right, so now I have to close this iterator, go all the way back to the start of the iterator, reopen it, and move to the next tuple on my left-hand side. So that makes for this slightly more complex flowchart. Um, I start, I have, I read one tuple at a time uh, from, did I get that consistent? Yeah. Um, I read one tuple from R, and then every time I call get next, I read another tuple from S, and uh, stick that together with the tuple from R, emit that, and if S turns out to be empty, I go to the next tuple in R. And I keep doing this until R is empty. All right, so the working set size here, as you guys said, uh, is one, uh, but, well, this is kind of bad. Um, and this addresses your question. In each of the previous cases, the working set size is small, but the, uh, the operators are kind of pipelined. So you're basically very intensively focusing on one tuple and just pushing it through the entire pipeline as far as you can get. In this case, however, you're accessing, how many times are you accessing the uh, the, the tuples in S. Or, excuse me, I got, let me back that around. Uh, how many times are you, oh yeah, yeah, how many times are you accessing the tuples in S? R times. So uh, I'm accessing it once for every, uh, for every uh, tuple in R. That's a lot of reads. That's a lot of times that I need to evaluate the entire pipeline on the right hand side. And that is one instance, because we're accessing the, the tuples multiple times out of order, this is one great example of a case where I'd want to, oh, I have an example of this that we just went over. Um, let me go to the next bit. And this is a great instance of, this is a great instance of a situation where we'd actually want to read in a whole bunch of tuples buffer them together, and then partition them into uh, blocks and perform this kind of join or this kind of cross product on each pair of blocks because that's going ah, to be way more efficient. <coughs> OK, so this process that we've just described is called nested loop join, and it essentially implements cross product. Um, there are some cases where it's more or less the best thing that you can do. Uh, usually when there's a very weak selection predicate on sitting on top of, uh, of, of a join. We'll get into optimization in a couple of uh, lectures. Um, but by doing this kind of buffering, partitioning the, the, uh, the tuples into blocks of tuples, this is referred to as a block nested loop join. And it's pretty much the, the standard entry level join uh, that most database systems will implement. OK, any questions so far? Yes? Is there any criteria on the partition between them? The question is is there any criteria on which the partitioning needs to be done? Um, Usually the partitioning happens based on how much memory you have or how big your cache is. 
Um, there's some actually very nice research work that kind of automates this process of, of picking the partition values. Uh, basically, you want to pick something that is big enough that it will fit in memory or cache, small enough that it won't overflow even if you have other operators in the system trying to do the same thing. Uh, does that address your question? Uh, yeah. In the, uh, how do we implement union in the... Ah, so the, the question is how to, um, how, to, uh, how to implement set union. And what? I'm very glad you asked that because uh, that is actually the subject of um, the time permitting component of the lecture. Uh, we'll get to that in a, hopefully, a, uh, let me address all the rest of the questions and then uh, I'll get to that. Yeah? The question is, if every tuple read requires a file I.O., will that impact performance? And the answer is yes. But again, the buffer, um, you, at least for the, the uh, purpose of the project, and actually in most other cases, um, you get buffering for free. So typically when you perform a read, uh, for five bytes, the operating system will actually load in a full kilobyte of data. So multiple five byte reads are actually going to be, the first one's going to be expensive, but the next couple are going to be cheaper. And most file systems are smart enough to figure out when you're scanning through a file, so they'll start prefetching later, uh, later in the file. Um, so the answer to your question is yes. Uh, which is why you would typically want to buffer in a relation operator. But in the case of most, uh, most operating systems, but the, the case is that most operating systems give you this buffering for free, essentially. Does that address your question? Uh, there's a question in the back. Uh, can you speak up? Ah, so uh, once again, the, the question, uh, what is the ideal size for a block? Big enough that it'll fit in memory, small enough that it won't, uh, or small enough that it, it will fit in memory, uh, and then as big as possible, basically. You, you, want it, uh, you want it to comfortably fit in memory, you don't want it to be super large. Uh, this is one of those cases where experimentation actually pays off nicely. Um, I would propose starting somewhere around 1,000 tuples, shrinking it or growing it depending on uh, your performance, uh, depending on the way that uh, your, your queries perform. Uh, eventually we'll get to cost-based optimization uh, where you'll have a little bit, uh, a few more tools to work with when making these decisions. But for now, Experiment, try things out, and uh, see what works, because it's usually very, very sensitive to uh, the query, very sensitive to what else is happening on the machine, although in this case that's not a problem, and a whole slew of other factors, like the disk drive, the operating system, all sorts of things. So that, that probably doesn't directly answer your question, but um, that's about as close as I can get. Yeah? Uh, the question is uh, about transaction control, uh, in particular what happens when there are multiple uh, processes trying to access and manipulate the data at the, the same time. Uh, that is a fantastic question. Uh, unfortunately, I will have to uh, ask you to wait about half a term for the answer. Um, any other questions? Yeah.
do, do, do. So the question is, uh, I explained the union operator again. Um, so going over here, imagine that the types of these two are the same. Uh, if I were doing a union of these two and I was okay with duplicate values, I, all, I need to return each of these values exactly once. So I, if the order doesn't matter, why not just scan one table and scan the other? One, two, three, A, B, C. Uh, does that clarify the point? Yeah. Um, so the block subdivision would be within the join operator itself. So the, the question is, how would we do the block subdivision? So let's say I'm doing a join between these two. I need to, uh, naively, I would need to read in each of these, uh, one, uh, sorry, each of these once for every row uh, in R. So let's say my memory, let's say I'm using a computer from the 20s. I, I can fit two numbers in memory. So I say, uh, four numbers in memory, excuse me. So I say, uh, let me load in two tuples of R. So I call get next on the left hand source, and I get a one. I call get next again, and I get a two. Now I have this buffer of two records sitting in memory in the join operator iterator. I call get next on s, I call get next on s again, and now I have two records of s sitting in memory. So I've called get next four times so far. Now, within this block, I'm going to do a, uh, I'm going to do a for loop over each of the elements in my left-hand side buffer, and then I'm going to do a for loop over each of the elements in my right-hand side buffer. So I'm going to join one against A, one against B, two against A, two against B. But this is all buffered. So it's much cheaper than calling get next each time I need another element. Exactly, because you're buffering everything, it's much cheaper. Uh, that was a very good observation earlier. Any other, uh, does that address your question? Okay. Any other questions? All right, so those are the simple operators. Um, union, cross product, select, project, and relation. Now I've been promising you that I'd talk about some more complex uh, operators. So today, uh, well, so since we finish a little bit early, I'll start talking about that uh, right now. Uh, one second. Well, I will start talking about that right now. So we talked about a whole bunch of different types of relational algebra. And so far, we've talked about a handful of different operators. Now, I've mentioned uh, that bag relational algebra could potentially introduce a distinct operator that would translate a bag into a set by get ridding, getting rid of uh, duplicate values. What other kind of operators uh, might I start uh, including in my, my extended form of relational algebra? Set difference, okay, uh, did I not include that? Whoops, sorry. Uh, set difference would be on there. And it, set difference and intersection, excuse me. Those, uh, I skipped those mainly for space on the slide, but good observation. Okay, so aggregate values. I'd, uh, I'd probably want to have some way of computing aggregate values. 
Hmm? Sorting. Okay, so I haven't said anything about uh, lists and ordering, so I'd want a sort operation. Limit. Okay, so if I have a sort, I may want to refer to specific elements in that list, uh, or specific ranges of elements in that list. One more that, uh, so is projection powerful enough? Can we do better than uh, just picking out a set of attributes? What if we wanted to combine the sum of two attributes? Will projection, as I've described it so far, allow us to do that? Not quite. Um, so, <coughs> in addition to the, oh, and outer joins, um, which we'll briefly talk about as well. So, there's a handful of different types of operations that uh, we might want to add uh, to make our uh, relational algebra more powerful. And, uh, do we, yeah. So we have about 10 minutes, so let's see how far we can get into these. All right, so our first, the first two, uh, let me talk about uh, sort and limit. Now the semantics of these are, uh, well, not necessarily super interesting. You take a set of values, you sort them. You pick the first n items from the list. I know this is not necessarily super uh, exciting to you. Maybe you were expecting something more interesting, but, um, the, I mean, you sort a list, you pick the first n items. These are necessary components if you're working with lists. Now here's kind of a, a little bit of a, a brain teaser for you guys. What happens if you use limit without sort? What would you expect to happen? Random elements. Random elements. I, do, I say uh, limit myself to fi the first five records in a set. What are the first five records? Who knows? Uh, it's still a valid query, but it might not necessarily produce anything uh, sensible. Okay, so limit is fairly straightforward. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, what about sort? So how would you go about implementing sort? And let me be a little bit more precise about this. Can you do all of the work in the same way that we've been uh, talking about the other operators? Can you do all of the work in get next? Okay, um, so how would you go about implementing sort then? Okay, so uh, I could do a merge sort. Um, if I was doing a merge sort, which, how many records would I need to be able to see before I output anything? I need to see all of the records, which makes get next kind of a, a bad place to implement a sort because my working set size, no matter how much effort I want to put into it, my working set size is still technically going to be the entire relation. I have to see every single tuple in my input before I can produce even a single output because there's always that chance that I might get another tuple that's smaller or that comes earlier uh, than uh, the first one that I'm currently looking at. So, uh, So how would I go about implementing sort, given that the word, hmm? Heap sort. Okay, um, actually let me back up. Let's assume that y'all have taken data structures, right, or algorithms, right? Uh, y'all know how to write a sort algorithm. So, and more to the point, Java gives you a whole bunch of these sort algorithms through the collections interface. So let's assume that there is a sort algorithm in place and let's assume that everything fits in memory because for project one it does. We'll get into the more complex cases in project two. But in project one everything fits in memory. So how would you go about implementing this? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so you have some attribute that you pick out and then you sort all of your tuples. In order to do that, you first need to read them all into memory. Here's some pseudocode. Uh, open your chart. Uh, when the sort starts, 
you just need to read in, uh, open the child, read in everything into memory, and then you can sort everything. Now, I may have given the answer away already. What are, will this approach work in general? The buffer size could be potentially be huge. It could potentially go beyond the size of memory. Uh, so potentially, this is not going to work. Um, and in fact, this will only work if you're working with relatively small data. So like I said, in project two, we'll go into a little more depth. Uh, we'll talk about some algorithms that work efficiently when you have to sort going to disk. For now, uh, this kind of uh, approach is, uh, is good enough. All right. Extended projection um, is another one of the simple ones. Originally, we were talking about working with a list of attributes. And now, uh, the main difference is that instead of just a list of attributes, we include a list of attribute expression pairs. Here's my question to you. How would you, or can you express uh, the original uh, way that we, we express projection using this new approach? Do you need both the original projection and the extended projection operator, or can you use just the extended projection operator? Yeah. OK, so you can use extended projection. Uh, how would you map, how would you represent project ABC in this form? Or in the extended form? Uh, a extended is a list of name, uh, whereas originally you had a list of attributes, now you have a list of attribute value, uh, sorry, attribute expression pairs, where the expression is some sort of arithmetic expression that tells you how to compute the value of, uh, of the tuple. So how would you express uh, project ABC in this? The expression can just be the, uh, a reference to the attribute. So you can have a column reference as an expression. So if I wanted to do project ABC, I would do project A colon column A, B colon column B, and so forth. OK, just want to make sure you guys are awake. Uh, all right, we don't really have time to get into, t into aggregation just yet. Um, Yeah, OK. So uh, any other questions on anything we've discussed so far? Yeah. The. So the question here is, if, uh, let me make sure I understand you correctly, uh, how big should the buffer be for sort? Is that? Yeah. Ah, so the, the, uh, the question is with my example earlier where I said we could have four integers in memory. Uh, you, uh, what I neglected to mention is that you'd also need another two integers to produce the output tuple. Or sorry, another two integers to produce an output tuple. Uh, so you'd need one, two, a, b in memory. And you'd also need a little bit of memory to store one, a as the output. Once that get, uh, got emitted, then you would need to store one B, and then you'd need another uh, two for two A. You'd only need to store one output tuple at a time because everything goes through get next. You only need one. You only need to produce one tuple at a time. Does that address your question? So, uh, yes, I, I neglected to mention the that you need six integers. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. 
the question is, what, is uh, what are use cases for extended projection? Implementing, uh, the answer is implementing SQL, essentially. Uh, so a, a SQL statement can say select, and then any expression in the select item uh, can appear in the select item. So select A plus B might be uh, something you'd want to compute. And the behavior of that is very similar to projection, except that the, uh, the output value is determined as an expression rather than as a single column. Does that address your question? Yeah. Yes, so in extended projection, uh, the the name expression pairs, the expression is the expression, the name is the alias. All right, um, if you have, we are out of time, so if there are any more questions, either uh, come down or take them to, or we'll uh, bring them up on Piazza or next class. See everyone on Monday. Have a great weekend.